Hello everybody, I'm Eric Grenier of the Red.ca and welcome to this Ontario Provincial By-Election Special for the uh, Hamilton Centre By-Election where the polls have just closed. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're going to be doing uh, for the next little while. Probably not going to be too long. We've seen how, uh, how quick the counting can be in Ontario in the past. Um, and make sure you can let me know, first of all, in the, chant if, uh, in the chat if you can hear me and you can see me. And of course, uh, you can ask some questions there and I'll try to answer them uh, and uh, you know, discuss the evening with you as, as it unfolds. So I'll tell you what's happening on the screen. Obviously, I'm, I'm right here in the bottom corner. Just above me, this is a uh, image from the website electionatlas.ca. There's a link to it in the show description below. Uh, it is just a terrific resource. I use it all the time in these live streams. I use it all the time in the work that I do. It just has uh, election results in this province, in uh, federally, uh, going back to really the beginning of the uh, 20th century. And I'm going to use it uh, a little bit during the night to uh, talk about uh, the results and uh, what's been going on for the Ontario NDP uh, in the Hamilton area. And then on the side, right now, I have the, um, the uh, webpage for Elections Ontario, excuse me, uh, the webpage for Elections Ontario. The last I checked, they hadn't had their official results page start up yet, uh, but I'm going to have to re uh, refresh this throughout the evening until the uh, unofficial results page turns up. Oh, now it's up there. Okay, so this is live happening. And uh, we'll just have to keep an eye on when that is going to happen. Okay, so let's discuss uh, what is happening with um, this by-election and why it's taking place. So this is Hamilton Center. This is the provincial riding. It's been held by the NDP since 2004 when Andrew Horvath won it in a by-election. Before that, it was held by the Liberals. She became leader of the Ontario NDP in 2009. She led them through uh, four election campaigns. She lost the last one. After that, she announced that she would be resigning her seat, running for the mayoralty of Hamilton. And that's why we have a vacancy here uh, today that is going to be filled. Um, the turnout we've seen ahead of this does not look like it's going to be too impressive, even by by-election standards. But I remind you, it was only 38% in the last election. So uh, that would be not great for a by-election, so it wasn't that great for a general election. But the results last time was 57% for Andrew Horvath and the NDP, 16.5% for the Progressive Conservatives, 13% for the Liberals, 9% for the Greens, 2% for the New Blues, uh, there was a 2% also for the Ontario Party, and then some other candidates as well. Uh, the number of candidates we have today uh, is quite a, a big number, and I'll talk a little bit about them once I'm reminded who they are once they come on the screen. But I think the, the major ones are, of course, are uh, Sarah Jama of the New Democrats. She is a, a disability advocate. There's been a bit of controversy, which is, I think, maybe something that um, increases the interest in these results today. Uh, there has been controversy over comments she's made in the past regarding Israel that has been called out as anti-Semitic by some uh, groups like Benai Brith. Uh, of course, she denies that. And, and But it has added something to what was supposed to be a foregone conclusion tonight. Uh, the challengers would be Peter Weisner, uh, who is a police officer, a sergeant in Hamilton. He's running for the PCs. There's Deirdre Pike, who's a social worker for the Liberals, and Lucia Yenantuono, who is a, an engineer, and she is running for the Greens. Those are the four candidates that we're really going to keep our eye on tonight to see how they do. Um, now, it is thought that the New Democrats are going to win this pretty easily because that's what they've been doing for the last little while. But, you know, it is a by-election, and if turnout ends up being 20 25%, like some of the things we've heard, uh, then it's going to be a contest about who can get the vote out. But if you look at the last few results, uh, it was 65% for Andrew Horvath in 2018, it was 52% in 2014, 61% in 2011, 45% in 2007, the first general election that took place in the modern-ish boundaries of Hamilton Center. Uh, so that would at least be the worst performance we've seen from the New Democrats in this riding since it was created. It, Hamilton Center used to be split between Hamilton East and Hamilton West. Uh, so I guess we'll be watching to see if the NDP is going to end up 
at least surpassing that 45% from 2007 and how every all the other parties are going to do. Uh, so uh, that, I think, sets the table a little bit. We're going to wait to see when the results start coming in. Ontario counts really, really fast, right? Because um, they have an automated process. Uh, if you've ever voted in Ontario, it's like a machine that you put it in and it takes it in. And if you've watched the Ontario election night uh, TV show uh, that I, I've been on for the last two on for the CBC, uh, they go really fast. I think we called an Ontario PC uh, government in 15 minutes or something like that. So there wasn't really that much to talk about. Uh, and I actually looked it up. It was around 9.30ish. Um, in 2022, that Hamilton Center was called for Andrew Horvath. Uh, now, that might have been because there's so much going on, it wasn't a, a priority call. But uh, it did take half an hour last time. So we'll see if we're going to be here for more than that. If we are, that's probably not a good job for the New Democrats. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, I should also point out, if you ever hear any sounds, any meows, anything like that, my cat is going around uh, and uh, she likes to try to become part of the show. Um, so if you want, you can ask uh, some questions to get me to have something to talk about uh, during the next, uh, let's say, give an hour. We'll see if where we end up having to be. Uh, so good evening to all of you that are here. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, to be able to chat with you again. We just did a by-election on Monday night with uh, Saint-Henri Saint-Anne in Quebec. Um, and uh, that one actually turned out to be quite a bit of a surprise. So this one was um, an interesting result. Okay, so I'm going to just take a look at some of your uh, questions uh, as as I uh, am getting going here. Um, and there's a question, you know, how the PCs and the Liberals will do, Jay Cross. Yeah, I think that is going to be really the, the big question, I think. Um, because unless we end up with a big surprise tonight and the New Democrats don't end up winning, uh, the PCs have made a lot of efforts to try to appeal to so-called working class blue collar voters. And they had some success. And I'll actually pull up the map from electionatlas.ca to talk about it. So if you look, this is the Hamilton area where the uh, by-election is taking place. Hamilton Center is the downtown riding in, in Hamilton. Um, this riding here, Hamilton East Stony Creek, this was a riding that used to be held by the New Democrats, and they lost it to the PCs in the last election. Their vote dropped by 24 points. Now, the incumbent was booted out from the New Democratic Caucus, Paul Miller, but he only got about 7% of the vote. It wasn't really that big of a factor. Um, even if, if all of those votes would have went to the uh, New Democrats, it, they would have still lost by a little bit. But it just shows you that the uh, PCs were able to take a seat like Hamilton East Stony Creek. Uh, it'll always be hard for them to win a seat like Hamilton Center. But progress, I think, is what they would want to see. But will there be progress for the PCs after um, you know some moves they made on the labor front since they came to power that... Uh, might have burned any of the bridges that they had started to build with labor over the last little while. And then there's the liberals. They really don't have much of a um, momentum going right now. They only had eight seats. They did win more votes than the New Democrats across the province in the last election. Uh, but, you know, they only have eight seats. They don't have official party status or recognized party status at Queen's Park. Uh, so what will happen to them? In this campaign. And then also the Greens. You know, there's been a lot of talk about Mike Schreiner and the Greens over the last little while because of the Ontario Liberal leadership. Um, is that going to have any impact that could be beneficial to the Greens uh, because they've been talked about a little bit? Okay, I'm going to uh, just, just make sure that the results are not coming up yet. And they're not, so we'll see. Um, oh, we got some people who, uh, who actually... Um, uh, volunteer during the campaign, Braden Belanger. I'm sure there's many more of you as well. Um, and yes, it, it's who got the vote out, I think is really going to be interesting here because I did see something from, uh, the Canada polling, uh, or polling Canada or whatever it is, um, a Twitter account that said, I don't know where they got the information cause I didn't see it myself, but they said it was turned out looking like it's going to be 20.5%. Uh, so that's pretty low. And if you can get your vote out, um, you know, how many people voted last time? 29,000 voted in the last, in the general election. And turnout could end up being about half that. So then now you're only talking about 14, 15,000 people. Um, if you can pull a decent amount, then you can pull off an upset or at least uh, move ahead of where you were last time. So we're still waiting to see when the first results will pop up. And once they do, we might see a lot of results come in. 
Uh, here's a, a question for Matthew Garris. Do incumbent parties usually perform more poorly in by-elections? I know that's an effect in the U.S. with complacent incumbent voters. It's often the case, but it's not always the case. Uh, I think sometimes you see in by-elections, especially when there's a really well-known candidate, which would be the case when you have a former party leader, um, or who she wasn't former at the time, uh, she was able to pull a lot of the vote, and the New Democrats can't count on all of that coming out. Um, once there's a new candidate, uh, people often, I think, re kind of calculate who they're going to vote for. They'll take another look at the candidates maybe than the, more than they would have before. And also in a riding like this that is so strongly New Democrat, there could be a complacency issue there where a lot of New Democrats say, this riding always goes NDP. It's gone NDP for nearly 20 years. Uh, so why bother go out and vote? Uh, someone else will go out and vote and I don't need to worry about it. So that could be a factor for the NDP. But then there's other ridings where the attachment is so much to the party rather than the... Um, rather than the candidate, uh, that you can get some really strong results. In the Mississauga Lakeshore federal by-election we had in December, uh, the Liberals outperformed, uh, despite the fact that they lost their candidate. But their candidate they replaced him with was Charles Souza, of course, the former Ontario Liberal uh, cabinet minister, finance minister. So he was able, I think, to boost uh, their numbers. Um, yes, sorry. Polling Canada was the Twitter account I was talking about. Um uh, we got Dylan McGuire as well, who was um, uh, busy on the NDP campaign. And it, that is a good point by Kim Hume. It is March break this week. That is not a good time to be holding a by-election. Uh, I know I have uh, neighbors that I haven't seen for the last few days because they seem to have been gone with their ch kids. And there's a lot of people I know are, are off work this week uh, doing something with their kids. So that's not going to help with uh, turnout. It's the same kind of thing as with a, a summer election some or summer by-election. Turnout can often be pretty anemic because people have other things to do. Uh, so I think that's going to be a result. Okay, we got our first numbers in. One poll reporting, and it is a good one for Sarah Jamma. Uh, she is off to the races with 47.5%. Uh, now there's only one. Uh, she's got a 57 votes right now. Uh, Pete Weisner is second with 26%. Uh, Deirdre Pike of the Liberals is at 14%, and uh, Lucia Yanenchbono is at 4%. Um, so that is a good start for the New Democrats, but um, it, it will, we'll have to wait and see uh, as this unfolds where the votes are coming from. Now, I don't think there's a huge disparity in Hamilton. Uh, when I looked at the results at the poll level, at the district level in the last election, Andrew Horvath won them all, except for, I think, two apartment buildings or retirement homes. I don't know what they were, uh, but they were very small. But uh, so at the beginning, we're seeing good numbers for the uh, New Democrats. And PCs are solidly in second. We got our second poll coming in. I think this is going to go pretty fast. Uh, and you can see that the margin has now grown to 91 votes for Sarah Jamma. I want to talk about a few of the other candidates just while we have a minute. So we have Matthew Lingard, who's running as an independent. Peter House, who's running as uh, the Electoral Reform Party. Uh, we have Mark Snow, who is the leader of the Libertarians. He is running here. You have John Turmel, who is the record holder for most elections, I believe, in the world. He must be over 100 by now in terms of elections that he's running. He has not won any. He did, he did manage to not lose one because the election was canceled. Uh, Levi Vassar is from the New Blues. Uh, she is an engineer and an interesting candidate at the at the very bottom, uh, Natalie Zian Yi Yan, uh, just because she ran as an independent last time. You don't often see independents taking another run at it. So far, she's got one vote. And um, the turnout, uh, they're not estimating it forward, but the turnout right now is 0.35. It'll get better. Okay, so we're now up to four that have been counted. And uh, yeah, we're starting to see that the New Democrats, it doesn't look like any of the controversies that are happening over the little while are going to uh, have much of an impact on their vote. If they can pull over 50%, this will be a good result for them. And if the PCs can manage over 20, I would say that's a pretty good result for them. Uh, Benjamin Schultz, uh, why did the incumbent resign? I, I assume you're talking about in this case. Well, that's Andrew Horvath. She was the leader of the New Democrats. Uh, she had run four election campaigns and um, didn't form government. And there was a lot of people who said that maybe that fourth run was maybe one too many. And so she resigned. And, but she did manage to successfully become the mayor of Hamilton. Uh, and just a few weeks ago, um, there was the awkward 
moment when Andrew Horvath had to welcome Doug Ford to Hamilton to thank him for a, a new announcement of spending uh, by the province. Well, Dylan uh, McGuire, Termel's 106 election. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, he runs everywhere. He tends to run in Ontario. He didn't run in the he didn't run in the Saint Henri Saint Anne by election uh, that took place earlier this week. But yes, he is continuing to uh, amass a record of losing elections. And uh, he, despite his his hundred and six runs for something provincial, federal, mayor, uh, name recognition still seems relatively low. He currently has two votes. Two votes. Okay, so. Uh, Sarah Jama is in the lead uh, after four polls are reporting. She's got 55% of the vote, and uh, Pete uh, Weisner's got 21%. Deirdre Pike has 12%, and Lucia Yen and Tuono has 4%. And I, I think I saw a question about whether this was a, a Horvath seat or an NDP seat. Uh, I think it is an NDP seat because the federal NDP holds the riding. Matt Green is the MPP, he's, or MP, sorry. He took 49% of the vote in the last election. So I, there's, a, there's a consistency in the NDP's vote. If you look at the Ontario NDP, if you look at the last four elections going back to 2011, you got 57%, 65, 52, 61. And if you're looking at the last three federal elections for the NDP, they got 49, 46, 46. So this is a pretty strong seat for the NDP. And actually, throughout history... Um, there's been a few times when the Liberals were able to win it. Win it. They won it last in 2003. Uh, the PCs last held this entire area in 1955. But you, the CCF was able to win this riding before. They won it in their first election uh, in the 1930s. Uh, Hamilton actually used to even elect Labour candidates around you know the 1900s, 1890s, the 1920s, things like that, before they were really organized parties. So it, there is a, a core labor vote here, and the NDP has been able to um, the NDP has been able to hold on to that. So I don't think it's a Horvath seat. I guess the question we'll see with the results in the by-election is uh, whether she was boosting the NDP or whether she was um, just coasting on the NDP's base support in the riding. The fact that she was outperforming the federal NDP by only you know, eight, nine points, uh, 20 points, I guess, in 2018. But it, it does suggest that she was um, a bit more popular than the NDP as uh, as uh, as its leader. Adrian Fung, uh, why is the Ontario NDP suddenly polling under the Liberals after they elected Styles, Yeah, Merritt Stiles became the leader. She was acclaimed, I believe it was in February. It was supposed to be in March, but they moved it up. So the last poll that we've seen was from Abacus Data had 41% for the PCs, 28% for the Liberals, and 22% for the NDP. Um, you know, when you look at what the results were in the last election, it was about 24% for both the Ontario NDP and Liberals. The Liberals were a few votes ahead. Uh, so the fact that the Liberals are polling a little bit better I don't find too surprising. I think it suggests that um, Stephen Del Duca might have been a bit of a drag on the party. But the brand of the Liberals is very, very strong. And between elections, particularly in Ontario, that brand lifts the provincial party quite a bit. Because I think for a lot of Ontarians, uh, provincial politics is second, maybe even third uh, after municipal. So when you're polling people in Ontario who are going to vote for, it's hard to make sure that they're not actually thinking about Justin Trudeau when they say they're going to vote Liberal. Um, so I think that's one of the things that boosts the Liberals above the NDP. It's what's happening during a campaign that I think becomes more important. So we're up to 17% uh, of the polls are reporting. We've got nine polls reporting out of 53. Turnout is so far 2%, uh, so we're not doing very good. We're just kind of imagining how that's going to project forward. Uh, and the margin for Andrew Horvath is now 667 votes. Um, you know, I, I think that we've seen enough. Uh, it's 919. Uh, I think we can probably call that the NDP is going to win this. Uh, when you think about the history of this riding and the fact that already the uh, NDP is at 57%, it's just very hard to imagine um, that the Liberals or the PCs are going to suddenly close that gap by this many votes. So I think that we can call that Sarah Jama will be the next MPP for the riding of Hamilton Centre. Um, but yeah, 
just like they do in the decision desk, it's a projection. We'll see. We'll, we'll wait until all the votes are counted. But it looks pretty good for the NDP. I think that they're probably going to win this one. And breathe a sigh of relief, I think, because there was um, probably some concern that they had chosen a candidate that was going to cause some problems. Uh, the stories of the last uh, week or two were not very good for the New Democrats. Uh, but it doesn't seem to have impacted their support very much because uh, at 57%, right now, Sarah Jama is matching what Andrew Horvath did in the last election. Uh, but one thing to keep an eye on will be what happens with the PC and liberal vote because we do have the PCs right now in third, 15%, which means they're down about a point and a half. And, um, well, more like one point. And the liberals are up about five points. So, uh, the leaderless liberals are doing better than they did when they had a leader uh, before. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a strong result so far for the New Democrats, which I don't think is too surprising. Um, but I did. I was watching um, a report on CHCH, which is the local news station, and they were saying they had sent out um, some reporters to go do what's called streeters. Streeters are when you go up and just literally just talk to whoever you run into in the street and ask them about the news of the day. And they said they had a really hard time finding people to talk about the by-election, that uh, some of the people they talked to weren't aware that the by-election was taking place. So, you know, that's not great. Um, it, it's hard to get people in, in interested in by-elections, particularly, I think, after a general election. I mean, the last election in Ontario was uh, nine months ago. And this election is not going to change the results in the House. It's not a there's no one here of a huge profile to really kind of get grab people's attention. Um, but yeah, there is, I think, an issue happening right now in Ontario when it comes to turnout, um, because for this riding to have 38 percent turnout in the general election is just really, really poor. And, um, you know, We'll see where it's going to end up tonight, but um, there does need to be something, I think, uh, done to uh, to uh, get people interested in Ontario politics. Yeah, Paul Nicholson, that's an interesting question, uh, comment about, um, you know, what's going to happen with the New Democrats over the next few years, because... You know, they always have this push and pull. Um, Andrew Owens, if you missed it, at 9.19, I did, I did call it. Yeah, as uh, was it Wasserman says, I've seen enough. Anyway, um, so this could be a pretty short uh, live stream, which is great. But um, uh, you don't want to test people's patience for too long. Um, but, you know, it is a, a, a good comment to make about... Um, the New Democrats and the challenge they face, because the more that they have candidates who are focused on uh, urban ridings like downtown Toronto, Hamilton Center is, you know, it, it is an industrial center, but uh, still we're talking about urban seats. Um, is the NDP going to be the broad kind of tent for that includes uh, progressives who care about, you know, social issues um, and equity issues, things like that, and also for... Um, People who are, are labor voters, uh, people who are working class voters who uh, see the role of the government in helping out the the little guy, as they say, you know, the kind of people that um, can switch between the liberals, uh, sorry, the PCs and the and the New Democrats. We see a lot of these kinds of voters, particularly in southwestern Ontario, particularly around Hamilton in northern Ontario, uh, people who don't vote left right, but they vote they vote according to. Um, which party they think is really going to help them out more in their lives, right? And and you see a lot of these sw switchers, and the New Democrats really have to be careful about keeping those people on board as well, because they lost seats in Windsor, they lost a seat in Hamilton. Um, you know, they do need to fight with the Liberals in Toronto, but they also need to fight the PCs in other areas. So it's a challenging balance for the New Democrats. So we'll see uh, what's going to happen there. Uh, Jay Cross, yeah, that is, you know, the theory about the ticket splitting with, with Ontarians, that when they have a government of one hue in Toronto, that they want a, a government of a different hue in Ottawa. I, I do think it's a thing. I'm not sure if it's cyclical or like people actually vote that way. But when I looked at the numbers, it was something like 80, 90 percent of elections went that way, that whoever was in one lost the, the opposite. Uh, so... 
Ontarians either do it kind of just because it's happened that way, it's cyclical, or I do, or they do think that it's better to have um, different parties in different capitals. And also, I think it might be a reflection that um, Ontarians can express their uh, dissatisfaction with a particular party um, at the provincial level and then do it differently at the federal level, depending on who's in office. But, you know, there are just differences between the parties themselves. I think that the federal liberal brand and, um, you know, the position that they put them in is better than the Ontario liberals. The PCs have made themselves, I think, more middle of the road than what we've seen from the federal conservatives. So there is also, I think, some reason behind it. Uh, Dylan, uh, is Ontario just election weary uh, or w weary? Uh, <clears throat> or should I ask Aaron? Uh, 2018, 2019. Yeah, there's been lots of elections. Uh, and I think that does have, have an issue on it. Um, but a lot of people, a lot of places have lots of elections. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, Jared, uh, if Canada will have a federal election after the Alberta election or not, I don't think so. I don't think that there'll be an election this year. I think that the New Democrats are probably going to support the budget. And that means no election for the year. I, I think that would be um, a weird thing to, to for the liberals to do. It doesn't seem like right now would be a good moment for them to engineer defeat. And for the New Democrats, um, going to the polls right now means potentially losing the influence that they have, right? And they don't want to lose that influence. Um, so why don't we reset a little bit? Um, right now, the uh, New Democrats... Sarah Jama, who uh, the writ has projected will be the next MPP for the riding of Hamilton Center, has 57% of the vote and a margin of 1,745 votes over the Liberals, who are in second. Um, now, this is not a lot of uh, votes. Turnout right now is only at 5.6, and we have about a quarter of the ballots cast or uh, counted. So that means we're probably going to end up somewhere around 20%. So that's really not very good. Um, but we're at 57% for Sarah Jama, and in second place, Deirdre Pike has 18%. This represents a jump of five points for the Liberals, if they can hold on to it. So that's not a bad showing for them, particularly when you're the smallest party at Queen's Park. You don't have a leader, and you don't really have much of a chance uh, in a riding like this to still be able to get out more of the vote, at least as a share, than you did in the last election. Uh, so that is 18% uh, right now for Deirdre Pike of the Liberals. And then in third place, Pete Weisner has 15%, which is down about a point and a half from where the PCs were in the last election. So, you know, that's down not very much. It's hard to read a lot into that. And for uh, Lucia Yanantuono, she has right now 7% of the vote. Uh, the Greens took 8.8 .8 last time, so that is down a little bit there. And for the rest, uh, the New Blues, uh, Lee Vice Vassar, uh, she has... Just under 1%, the New Blues, which is kind of a, a party to the right of the progressive conservatives, uh, they took 1.7%, so they're down a little bit from the last time. Mark Snow, the leader of the Libertarian Party, is at 30 votes, 0.66%. And uh, at the bottom is John Turmel, the record holder for most elections. All right. I've been talking for a little bit. I just need to take a drink of water, so if you'll bear with me. All right, there you go. Okay. <clears throat> oh, Chris Day, am I pronouncing someone's name wrong? Uh, let me know if I am. I, I always, I did try to listen to, uh, I, I did try to get some uh, pronunciation of all the names before I uh, did this. So if I'm pronouncing one wrong, let me know, please. Well, for the Alberta election, well, the Alberta election has to take place on May 29th, um, but it doesn't really have to. Uh, just like in any other uh, jurisdiction in the country, um, it's still up to the premier or the prime minister to um, to uh, uh, call an election. If Daniel Smith decides to go early, then she can do that. And there's nothing the lieutenant governor can do. If uh, Daniel Smith decides not to go again. There's not much that can be done. So 
the scheduled date is May 29th. We'll see if it happens. I think it is going to be May 29th, um, but that is how it works in uh, uh, in Alberta. All right, now everybody, let's be nice in the comments. Um, so uh, we'll take another look at what the numbers are right now. We have uh, 57% for Sarah Jama. So again, that is matching what the Ontario New Democrats did in uh, the last campaign. And it is uh, down from where they were in 2018, but above where they were in 2014. So this is a pretty middle of the road result for the New Democrats. It's a strong result, I should say, for them. But I mean, in terms of how it stacks up to um, how it stacks up to uh, past results for the NDP, it is right in the kind of the juicy part. So it's a very like normal amount for uh, the New Democrats to take, which I think is what they would want to see. Right. Because the New Democrats aren't doing really well in the polls. It's not like they've suddenly surged ahead. Um, they're more or less stuck at where they were in the last election. Uh, it's hard to get um, attention as an opposition party at Queen's Park. Uh, so for the New Democrats, the fact that they are holding the amount of vote that they got in the last campaign, which was still a, on the whole, not a bad campaign for them when they form official opposition, take 24 percent of the vote. Uh, I think that is a good night for the New Democrats, in that they can be happy about it. Uh, Canada polling, any numbers I didn't expect in these results? Um, I got to say, this looks so similar to what it was last time that it's not that surprising. I actually thought that the NDP was going to do worse because, um, because they lost their leader, who you would think would pull a lot of the vote just on her own. She's in debate. She's Everybody would know who she was in the riding. So you'd almost expect that the party would do worse. So I kind of expected that the NDP would end up maybe 10 points lower than this. And um, we chalk a lot of it, a lot of it up to um, the lack of a leader, uh, the former leader there. But this is a pretty strong result. I don't, I'm not too surprised that the NDP is winning it, but I am surprised that they are doing as well as... Um, as they did last time. Uh, in terms of the other numbers, you know, for the Liberals to finish second with more of the vote is also a little bit of a surprise, right? Because they have been in the news lately for not great reasons in the sense of part of the party was trying to draft the leader of the Green Party to take over their leadership, despite the fact that there was some sitting MPPs in the Liberal caucus who wanted to run for the leadership. Um, it didn't seem like it was a party that uh, had a lot going for it, but you could put this another. You could think about this another way. The New Democrats had Merritt Stiles, who launched her a bid for leader, and no one else really ran against her. Well, no one literally did run against her, but it was clear from the beginning that it was going to be her. And so the NDP didn't have a leadership race, and so she just became leader, and um, everybody moved on. But for the Liberals, they're going to have a leadership race. They are being talked about. The fact that they had a convention recently that changed the rules to the leadership, that got attention. The fact that they have some people who will they, won't they run, that gets attention. Like people will be talking about the liberals probably a little bit more than the New Democrats over the next year or so because they're going to have a competitive leadership race. So I think that could actually help the liberals, even if it, the race has some weird you know, moments in it. Uh, but just today there was the news that um, Navdeep Baines, who was the former cabinet minister in uh, Justin Trudeau's government, um, used to represent a Mississauga riding, that he was thinking of um, running for the Ontario Liberals. So that is a that is a name that is has some national profile. That is someone who uh, you know left politics. If if he is really thinking about getting into the race, that'll be good for the Ontario Liberals. So having people talk about the party, maybe this is one of the reasons why. Um, why they're doing a little bit better than they did in the last campaign. And uh, Deirdre Pike also seems to have been a, a, an interesting candidate and well-spoken. And, and, you know, she might have just been able to um, get some of the support out for her. For the PCs, you know, they're holding their vote. Um, so, you know, I, they're down about a point, which isn't much. And, you know, they didn't have much of a shot in this riding. And so the thought that maybe the problems that the PCs have had with labor over the last year or so would sap their support in this kind of writing doesn't seem to have taken place. Uh, so for the PCs, I think they can be happy, happy-ish with this result. Uh, and for the Greens, 
know, the greens are getting 7%, just under 7%. It's not great. They had 9% last time, but the Green Party always has really tough time in by-elections when they're not really in contention. They just have so much tr trouble getting their vote out. Um, and so they're actually doing a decent job getting their vote out. Uh, so I think that's not a bad result for the Ontario Greens. Um, the federal Greens, they have a lot of trouble with this kind of by-election. So that's not a bad result for them. Uh, Brave New North is surprised that the PCs didn't uh, get a bump. Um, yeah, you know, well, why don't we go to the map again? Because I, I wanted to, there's something interesting about the map um, and the PC results. So uh, look up in the top corner. So Hamilton Center, this is the riding here that we're talking about, and they picked up Hamilton East Stony Creek. Now, they picked up Hamilton East Stony Creek with a six-point gain. So that was enough for them to win the riding because the, the NDP dropped by 24 points. So that was a big problem. But if you look at the rest of the area, Hamilton Mountain, the PCs were only up one point. They were still 15 points behind. Hamilton West, Ancaster, Dundas, this was a riding that thought that maybe they could pick up. They were only up two points. And then in Burlington, uh, the, which they already held, they were up two points. So it was more in Hamilton East Stony Creek that the PCs were able to make this breakthrough in order to win the seat because in the broader region, uh, Flamborough, Glanbrook, Brook, only three points. Um, they weren't able to really make the kind of gain that they might have hoped to. And for the PCs in Hamilton Center, if you look at their results going back to 2007, so they had 16.5 last time. In 2018, they had 15.7. In 2014, they had 14.3. 2011, they had 13.2. So that's progress, 13 to 14 to 16 to 16.5. Uh, but it's still the base for the PCs in this riding is just so, so small that it's very hard for them to win this kind of seat. It's very hard for the PCs to win any any seat that has the word center in it is going to be a tough one for them. These downtown core ridings in Toronto, in Hamilton, in Ottawa, um, that's going to be tough for the PCs to win. It's getting the ones around that helps them form government, combining rural seats with suburban seats. That's the, that's the, uh, that's the, the math for the PCs. For the NDP and for the Liberals, it's the urban core ridings and the suburban. That's kind of just how it works. So Hamilton East Stony Creek was more of a suburban riding. Hamilton Center is an urban riding and the PCs just aren't in contention for it. The liberals can be, uh, as you see in the uh, in the federal riding, liberals were able to get 33, 29, 27% of the vote of the last few elections. Um, so they are able to compete as recently as 2007, they had 29% of the vote at the provincial level here. So that is more the kind of battle here. But I think for the NDP, uh, Hamilton Center is always going to be a, a, an easy one for them to win. All right, let's uh, reset with uh, the results. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to pull them up here. So we're now at 45% of the ballots called. CBC called it. Oh, when did they do that? I called it at 919. I said the time. So let me know if I did it first. Let me know if I if I did it faster than Sharon. Um, Sharon is my old coworker who uh, called these writings, called these things. Okay. So yeah, we're at 45% uh, of the polls are reporting. 56% of the vote for Sarah Jama. 19% uh, for Deirdre Pike. They can get up to 20%. A 20% mark for the Liberals would be a, a little moral victory for them, I think. So we'll see if, if they're going to be able to do that. Uh, for the PCs, they're now at 15%. So they're dropping a little bit since we last checked on them. And the uh, Greens are at just under 7%. And no one else is cracking 1% of the vote or even 100 votes at this stage. Canada, Canada poll. Okay, you call it nine seventeen. Okay, well, good for you. Oh, okay. Yeah, I did beat CBC. All right. Well, that's good. I'm happy to at least done that. Um, all right. So, um, so yeah, that's the that the this is the results here. Um, not really that surprising, I guess. Uh, we'll wait to see where everybody. Um, finishes up, at least stick with you at least until the top of the clock. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, let's, uh, let's take another look at these numbers. So the uh, New Democrats right now have 6,000 votes. Um, so they're 
keep in pace with how they did in the last election, right? Because they have 56.5% of the vote and 57.3% uh, is what they did last time. So uh, the turnout is not impacting them. The fact that uh, turnout has dropped in this riding is not, um, is not having an impact on NDP support. Uh, it could have be having an impact on the PCs and maybe the Greens because they are underperforming. And for the Liberals, they're overperforming, though uh, they're still likely to lose votes when this is all said and done. Uh, actually, there is a chance that the Liberals could gain raw votes because right now we got 45% of the polls reporting, which means that uh, if the rest of the polls report the exact same way as the 50, 45% have so far, then you can expect the Liberals to double their vote from what they have now, right? Which would put them at somewhere around 4,000. So the Liberals took 3,799 votes last time. So if we do see that the Liberals top that number of 3,800 votes, then it means that they got people to vote for them that didn't vote for them nine months ago. And it looks like they're probably going to be the only party who has that chance. So we'll see if they do that. I think that's going to be the the mark to watch for the rest of the night is whether the Liberals can get 3,800 votes and actually get at least one more vote than they did last time, uh, which would be a big jump for them. So um, we'll take a look at um, the uh, numbers from uh, uh, the Abacus poll that was, uh, or at least I'll talk about them, I'll show them to you. But... Um, So that poll from Abacus had the PCs at 41%, the Liberals are at 28%, the NDP at 22%, the Greens at 5 So more or less within the margin of error of what were the results in the last, uh, last election. Uh, for Doug Ford, uh, the poll found 34% of Ontarians had a positive impression of him, 43% had a negative impression, and 19% had a neutral impression. So those neutral people, um, neutral people often means that they don't really know that much about the person they're talking about. But in the case of the premier, Doug Ford, uh, his name recognition would be nearly 100%, right? So only 4% said they didn't know what they thought of Doug Ford. So a lot of those neutral people, uh, I think, are what ke are what keeping the PCs afloat, that there's 34% of Ontarians who like Doug Ford, and then there's 19% of them that don't have a problem with him. Uh, they neither really like him, but they don't dislike him either. And I think that is what is really uh, the key... <laughs> Cute little demo for the PCs. Just a moment. Um, there was a question there uh, from uh, Brave New North, the 6.8% for the Greens. Uh, is that good or bad for them? It's, it's not too bad. They had 8.8 .8 last time, but in 2018, they had 5.8. .8. So they're doing better than that. Uh, they had 8.6 in 2014, but 3.7 in 2011, but 9.4 in 2007. So when they're, when it's a decent election for them in Hamilton Center, they get somewhere around 9%. When it's not, they get somewhere around 4 to 6. So this is somewhere in the middle of that. And considering it's a by-election where, um, you know, the Greens did not have much of a chance of winning the seat, you know, it's not bad that they're ending up here. But just returning to the poll, the other one, uh, the other person that they tested that I wanted to talk about was Merritt Stiles, the NDP leader. Um, she had 18% who had a positive impression of her, 17% had a negative, so that more or less balances out. But there was 27% with a neutral and 38% who said they don't know. So uh, Merritt Stiles still has very low name recognition. A lot of the neutral people probably said they were neutral because they had nothing, they didn't know anything about her. Um, so I think that's for the new Democrats going to be their challenge. That Styles is starting out more or less even. That's not so bad, but um, the name recognition is going to be the big challenge for them. And for the Liberals, they tested some of the candidates that are mulling a bid. So Nathaniel Erskine Smith, Yasser Nakvi, uh, Ken Shu, and also Mitzi Hunter, who at the time was still considering a bid, but now she might run for Toronto mayor. All of them had much worse name recognition than even merit style. So whoever big takes over the liberals uh, is going to have to um, get some name recognition going for a while. All right. So we'll return to this 55% uh, 
uh, for the New Democrats under uh, for Sarah Jama. So 55, 55.8%. So they dropped a teeny little bit. Uh, they had been more at the 56% mark or a little bit higher than that. Um, and now uh, they're at currently 55.8%. Uh, the PCs are at 16.5, so uh, they're, uh, sorry, the PCs had 16.5, they're currently at 15.2, so they dropped about a point and a little bit more than that, so not a great result for them, but that is very small amount when you think about how much lower turnout's going to end up being. Uh, and the Liberals are the ones who seem to be making the biggest gain here, because they're up six points right now. Uh, they had 13% last time, they're 19.3%. And as I mentioned, they are potentially going to gain some votes over um, what it was last time. And if you can gain raw votes in a by-election, uh, that's always pretty, pretty good. Because that means not only are you getting your vote out, but you're getting more people to come over to you, right? So um, that's tough to do in a by-election, because for sure, the 3,799 people who voted for the Liberals last year, a lot of them are not voting today. And it means that the Liberals are going to be making up with some conversions. They're converting some people to vote for the Liberals. Where that's coming from, though, is a little bit harder to calculate because the NDP is down right now about a point and a half. The PCs are down about a, a little over a point. So, you know, that's two and a half points right there that the Liberals might be picking up. The Greens are down two points, so there's another four and a half points. And then I guess all of the smaller parties, maybe. But it's not clear who is actually bleeding this small amount of vote to the Liberals, but it does seem it's coming from everybody, which is not a bad thing for the Liberals. Um, because if they're in trying to be more of the centrist party, if they can take votes from the PCs, the Greens, and the New Democrats, that's, uh, that's where they want to be. Um, there's a question there about the new blues. Um, well, they're not doing very well tonight. They're at 9% of the vote. Uh, they had 1.7 last time. And if you combine the new blues and the Ontario party, uh, from the last election, they had, uh, together about 3.3% of the vote. So this is not a very good result for them. Uh, I think for those parties that they were, in a little bit like the People's Party, uh, were motivated a little bit more by the pandemic and issues related around that. Uh, but as it goes back into the rearview mirror, it's less of a galvanizing issue, I think. So uh, for that party, I don't particularly see a, a bright future for them unless unless the Ontario PCs uh, really start to uh, falter over the next couple of years and 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 opportunities there for them to make a little bit of a, a breakthrough. But it, it's going to be hard for any party like that to, uh, I think, make any progress. As we saw with the PPC in the last federal election, they didn't get close to winning a single seat. Uh, it's hard to concentrate that vote in a particular region um, when you're down into the low single digits. Excuse me one moment. <clears throat> Sorry about that. I've been noticing with these uh, by-election live streams, my ability to talk for a long time all by myself uh, is stretched. My throat eventually, um, my throat eventually gives out. It's easier when you have someone to chat with, which is why I think they do that. All right. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, we're now at uh, fifty-eight percent of the votes counted. This is pretty quick, but I was actually expecting it to be a lot quicker because I remember just how fast some of the votes came in last time in the. Uh, in the uh, in the provincial elections, but um, I assume that we're going to be moving pretty quick as things move on. Uh, so we have right now fifty five percent for Sarah Jama. We have nineteen percent for Deirdre Pike. Uh, as I mentioned before, the target for them could be the three thousand seven hundred ninety nine votes they got last time. If they can increase their raw votes. Uh, that would be a, a big result for them. And you have the PCs who are now at 15.4%, so they've dropped uh, a little bit over a point. All right. So we have the Greens right now at 8.8, .8, so they're down about two points um, and uh, and nearing a, a, a thousand votes. They got 2,500 votes last time, so uh, quite a bit lower. So yeah, that's where we are. Um, the New Democrats, I think, uh, going into this campaign, we're hoping to... Uh, 
to just get through it with another sizable win so that they would silence any doubters that, you know, things aren't going well for the party, that they're struggling to maintain themselves as the official opposition against the liberals who get a fair bit of attention compared uh, considering they only have eight seats to the new Democrats 30 ish. Um, so <clears throat> I think that this result will allow everybody to move on in terms of just the results in terms of the NDP strength. Uh, the liberals have a teeny little bit of a um, teeny little bit of a moral victory, I suppose. And, you know, if you if you want to have a moral victory, that's great. But parties, you know, need more than moral victories, right? Sammy Baj, uh, a uh, um, fan of electoral reform. The electoral reform party was one of the ones here. Peter House uh, got 80 votes, 0.6% of the vote. That's where he sits right now. But if this was a, a, a proportional representation kind of result, well, she Sarah Jamis still did, did get a majority of the vote. So um, so she would still be getting in regardless of, uh, of the system. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, Mika Kress, yes, the the recent Ontario Liberals Convention helps their chances in the riding. Um, you know, it doesn't hurt. It was in Hamilton, wasn't it? And, you know, I, that probably galvanized the uh, the local volunteers a little bit. There was probably a few extra people available to go knock on doors that weekend. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I don't think that that would have hurt. Um, it turned out being well-timed to have the convention there in Hamilton. Uh, whether it's really is what's behind this six point jump for the liberals in this riding probably not but you know uh, all else being equal i'm sure it didn't hurt but what's really interesting about um that convention is that they decided to change the leadership rules so prior to uh the convention the liberals were one of the last parties to um have a delegated convention um which means that they had contests throughout the province for people to choose delegates to go to the convention to have one of these old-fashioned uh, things were, you know, it's only a couple thousand people who vote and people cross the room. It's very exciting. It was very old fashioned. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a decent, interesting system, but the liberals have decided to move to a one member, one vote system that is used by the federal liberals. It's used by the federal conservatives. It's used by the Ontario PCs, uh, where each riding is equally weighted. So what happens is that a riding, if there's 2000 members in it, if there's 200 members, it's worth the same amount of points, and the amount of points you get is based on the proportion of the vote that you got. So if you get 55% of the vote in a riding, then you get 55 points. Um, it's meant to reflect the, the regional nature of you know, our politics, that you are not only just amassing the most amount of votes, but you're getting it from the most different kinds of regions. Um, an interesting little thing with that, though, is that it's possible to get interesting results, unintended results. Um, what we saw, for example, in the Ontario PC leadership race in 2018, Doug Ford defeated Christine Elliott on the last ballot. He only got a few more points than her. It was 50 percent or something, 51 percent of the points. But Christine Elliott actually got more of the votes. She got not very many more, but she got more of the votes. Christine Elliott got a majority of votes from the PC members. But Doug Ford must have had the broader regional support. No. Christine Elliott actually won more ridings as well. But Doug Ford was able to rack up more points in the ridings that he won than Christine Elliott was able to do in the ridings that she won. And so the PCs got a leader that got the second most amount of votes and won in the second most amount of ridings. So this weighted system is, you know, it's a clever system, but then you can also get results that are maybe unintended uh, in terms of what the design of the of the system is. So we'll see what happens with the liberals. They're also going to give some points to student groups and uh, women's groups uh, within the party. So uh, we'll see how that plays out. Other key thing will be how long you need to be a member, uh, when you need to sign up. That's one of the issues with these kinds of races that I've always seen is that it, um, um, it encourages people to sign up and then vote for the candidate, and then never be involved with the party again, uh, which is why, you know, the delegated system did require a little bit more commitment to the party. But, you know, there was the decision not to not to do that. Uh, 
uh, Max Christie, if, if the new system will help any of the candidates. Um, I'm not sure if it'll help any of the candidates in particular. Um, <clears throat> it'll help a candidate that is, um, well, more broadly known, I suppose, because if you have a candidate who um, is very popular in a particular area, let's say, let's say Yasunak be here in Ottawa. All right, he was an MP, he was an MPP. He's now an MP. Let's say he was able to just run up the numbers in Ottawa, sign up a lot of people, and um, you know he might have an advantage over someone like Nathaniel Erskine Smith, who maybe doesn't have as much of a, a regional base, is not able to sign up as many members in one place. So if you have a weighted system, then it means that the fact that Yasser Nakvi is likely to do really well here in Ottawa only has a limited um, a limited impact. Whereas someone like Nathaniel Erskine Smith, uh, maybe he can spread out his support across Toronto a little bit better. So maybe it's going to help out candidates that are less regionally focused, um, but it's it's hard to know right now what it's going to be because so we have um, Yasser Nakvi who is going to have you know a good base here in Ottawa. If he runs, these are all people that are saying they might run. We don't know if they will or not. You have Ted Shue in uh, Kingston and the Islands, a smaller region. He's not going to have as much of a base. Nathaniel Erskine Smith uh, in Toronto, uh, that's a bit better. He's been an MP since 2015, so maybe he can have some appeal in Toronto. Uh, Adil Shamji uh, is just a, a rookie MPP. Uh, same thing with uh, Stephanie Bowman. They're both first timers, so I don't think they're going to have much of a base. And then we get to the people who are being rumored. So you have Nadi Baines, who used to be an MP for Mississauga, uh, and he's known to be a good organizer. So if he gets into the race, that could be pretty big because you know he'll do really well in Mississauga, but he also has links throughout the province through his time with the federal liberals. Um, so he could be a pretty, pretty uh, formidable candidate. And the other candidate has been bandied about is Bonnie Crombie, who is the mayor of Mississauga. Um, <clears throat> I assume that means that only one of them will run, right? If they have two candidates from Mississauga, they'll kind of eat each other's votes and <laughs> that won't work out. So we'll see what happens there. So, yeah, I don't know if... Uh, I, I would say that it probably levels the playing field more, this kind of system. Because instead of... Versus a delegated, I don't know, the delegated system... Um, I, I was thinking about it more in terms of just if the writings weren't weighted. But the delegated system, I think, would, would advantage uh, candidates who have a deeper links within the party organizationally. Um, so that would have been someone like Navdi Baines and Yasser Nakvi, maybe less so uh, Ted Shu or Adam Shamji or, or uh, uh, Stephanie Bowman. So, um, so we'll see. We'll see when the race is going to be, how long it's going to be. These are going to have a lot of, uh, a lot of impacts as well. Oh, this is an interesting question from Dylan Pedro. How are Doug Ford, uh, his odds in 2026, if Pierre Poliev wins the next federal election? Uh, that's the big question. Um, because there is this a tradition, I talked about it a bit earlier in the live stream, about how in Ontario politics, if there's a party that is governing in Ottawa, the provincial party tends not to do very well. During the Stephen Harper years, it was Dalton McGuinty. Uh, during the Jean Chrétien years, there was Mike Harris in Ontario. During Brian Mulroney's time, it was David Peterson and Bob Ray. Uh, during the Trudeau years, it was the PCs all the time, right? It was Leslie Frost, John Robards, um, and Bill Davis, uh, Frank Miller. So uh, definitely just by that, I think if Pierre Poliev wins the next federal election, um, it would hurt Doug Ford more than if he didn't win. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but I, I think that's actually what's going to happen if Poliev wins that Doug Ford's PCs will probably take a hit if um, the Conservatives aren't that popular. Uh, anybody who's upset with Pierre Poiliev by, you know, one or two years into a, his mandate is going to take it out on Doug Ford. And I'm not sure if Doug Ford is going to um, get a lot of help from the Conservatives. Um, I don't know. It's hard to know what, what their links will be, because we did see in the last couple of provincial uh, federal campaigns that the federal Conservatives thought Doug Ford was hurting them. And uh, maybe he took it a bit personally. <clears throat> All right, so we are at the top of the hour. We've got 72% of the votes are counted. Uh, I do think I'm going to have to call it pretty soon. Um, 
because you know we are uh, getting to the uh, the end of the night, and it's very clear that Sarah Jama has won this. Uh, there's probably not a lo- enough ballots left to be counted to actually uh, decide the outcome here. So, <clears throat> so that might be it. And my throat is giving out, as you can see. So, so, um, so why don't we uh, start wrapping up? If any of you have any last-minute questions, you can uh, give them to me, um, and then we can uh, get to the to the end of this. But, um, but yeah. So, for the New Democrats, this was a good result for them. They are a party that is. Um, the opposition party, they don't get a huge amount of tension in, um, in you know, the Ontario political media. Um, they had a candidate who was pretty controversial and had bad news stories for the last couple of weeks. Um, but still, they're getting right now 55% of the vote. That is down only two points from where they were in the last election and is above some of the results that they've had, for example, in 2014. So I think for the New Democrats, this is a, a good result. They can be happy with this. It avoids any uh, questions about whether the party's in trouble or anything like that, so they can go forward with this, and I think that's really what they wanted. Oh, Peter Wilsoncraft, yes, you're right. Leslie Frost just uh, did come in um, before Trudeau, but that was during like the short little time with the Diefenbaker years, um, you know, because you had Pearson and Pearson and, and Frost at the same time, uh, and then before uh, Diefenbaker was Saint Laurent, and then at that point you had Frost and uh, uh, George Drew. Um, so you get kind of this cycle and it was, uh, the last time you had the two parties being the same for a, a decent amount of time was Mitch Hepburn and, uh, Mackenzie King and they hated each other. So there you go. They were always at odds with each other. Anyway, I'll continue with my little resume there. Um, <clears throat> uh, with the liberals, the liberals are at 20%. So they're up seven points from the last election, and they have a good shot by the end of the night uh, to maybe match the amount of votes they had in the last election, the general election, despite the drop in turnout. So that's pretty good. Um, So for the Liberals, I think this is actually a terrific result for them. It's the best one they've had here since 2014, when they took uh, 23.45% of the vote, and that's when they were forming government. Um, So that that is a good joke for... Uh, good joke. I'm reading someone's so I'm reading the chat as I'm talking. Uh, so that is a good result for the liberals. Obviously, they would have preferred to have won or get even close to it. But for them, you know, they don't have a lot going for them right now. So the fact that they can get nearly 20 percent of the vote in this by-election is, I think, uh, a strong result for them. And they can be pretty happy about it as well. And then there's the PCs who right now are at 15.5 percent. So they're down about one point from where they were in the last election. Uh, that's all right for them. Uh, this is not a good writing for them. And for the PCs to hold their vote after some of the labor issues they've had over the last little while, uh, I think that's good for them. For the Greens, they're now at about 7%, which is down about two points from last time. Uh, so for the New Democrat, for the Greens, um, you know, they didn't lose as much as their vote as they could have, which often happens for Green parties in by-elections. Um, so I think that is uh, where we're going to end it. Uh, this was a good result for the New Democrats. Another win for them. Andrew Horvath uh, departing did not cost the New Democrats this seat. And I think for uh, the NDP, um, they'll be happy to put this by-election behind them because it was a little bit of a, a tricky one for them. So Sarah Jama will be the next MPP for Hamilton Center. The New Democrats hold this seat. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in uh, during this uh live stream. Uh, It's been fun to have these two uh, this past week. Uh, The next one on the docket will probably be for the Prince Edward Island election on April 3rd. Uh, So that'll be worth tuning in. And of course, go to the writ.ca for all the latest from me. Go to the writ podcast. You can find it wherever you get podcasts. I got a good one tomorrow going up with the Philip J. Fournier of 338 Canada. We talk about everything, um, everything happening in politics right now. So it'll be worth tuning in. So good night, everybody. Thanks very much for tuning in. And uh, I'll see you next time.